So I do have the chat up. And I know there's some people that are doing the replay. And that is fine. But I want you to put into the chat on whether, hello, <laughs> on, <laughs> on whether you have met your shadow self. Have you met your shadow self? Contemplate that right now. Because we're diving in. So you can say yes, no, maybe. Uh, to some people, this is quite new. And to other people, they have maybe been doing shadow work for many years. So what is the human shadow that we're going into? I love this stuff. Like you don't understand how excited I was to do this workshop tonight. The shadow to me is known as our beast. <laughs> and if you can think about that inner beast that you may have, maybe when someone flipped you off the wrong way, you have an energy that rises up or, or that mama bear energy or that papa bear, right? I'm going to take care of my family. So to me, the shadow is a beast, but it's also our darker side, okay? And we all have darker aspects. Now, before I delve into the darker aspects of who we are and the things that we've done, I believe it's no big deal. We all fuck up, pardon my language. And when I, when I have seen, like I have seen so much doing readings, okay? You think you've seen some TV shows that are like imprinting? Okay, I've learned so much in my years of doing readings and working with people on a spiritual level and experiencing what they've gone through and how they've healed. As they're walking the spiritual path, I've learned many things that have healed myself, but also have healed other people as they're walking their path. So the beast side, our beast. I mean, I love my mistakes. I love my hardcoreness. It's shocking, right? Like when, when a truck driver talk starts coming out, it's like, whoa, who's this person? It's entertaining in a way, right? But we cannot be ashamed of the darker aspects of life, right? Everybody's heard of sins and everybody's heard of regrets. And we've all experienced them. Some people have experienced things on a larger level and more extreme level than others. But it is our darker side. And we're going into this because our darker side is our hidden side, okay? It's that lost or forgotten self is the place within us that contains all of our secrets, all of our repressed feelings. Think about all the things inside that you've ever wanted to say, but you couldn't. That is part of the spirit of our darker self, our shadow self. It's our primitive impulses, right? It's our instincts. And it's everything that gets our attention that seems to be unacceptable, maybe sh sinful or evil, right? Negative. So this hidden place actually lurks within our unconscious mind and it contains our trauma. It's our suppressed or our rejected emotions, our rage, our jealousy, our hatred, our greed, our deceitfulness, our selfishness, our ego. I love the ego because in my path, I've learned that my ego is my best friend. When my ego speaks, when my shadow self speaks, I listen. 
because I trust it. And where I came in my life, the ego and the, and the darker aspect of me, my shadow self kept me safe when I wasn't safe. And sometimes that's how our shadow self connects to us. When we're going through a traumatic event or in a fight, or we're dealing with an injustice in our life. But you cannot escape the shadow. Let me tell you, because everyone has a shadow. Everyone has a shadow. Everyone carries a shadow. Okay. Now, this is interesting because my theory is that everyone carries a shadow within us. And I say that's why I got a belly because I got a beast in there. Okay. <laughs> Not that, you know, I'm putting down my, my stomach, but that's where I believe I carry it. My belly carries my shadow self. It's in that solar plexus, in that sacral plexus, in, in that root, right? My lower self. And my higher self is outside of me. It's, a, it's like a, my channel, okay? My entire channel is my higher self. My higher self is above me and outside of me. And that's how I believe it works for me. But everyone has and carries a shadow. And the less it is embodied by the individual conscious self, the wilder, the blacker, and the denser it is. So it is very important that we pay attention to our animal instincts, let's say. So everyone has a shadow. It's not separate from us. It's a part of us. It never leaves. It's always there. And it's when we ignore it is that when we ignore it, it turns against us. It gets pissed off. It's like, hey, lady, you're not listening to yourself. So I'm going to teach you a lesson. <laughs> it really does do that. Is the shadow self evil? No, it's not. The shadow psyche or the shadow archetypes are not evil. But they are manifestations of our repressed desires, our emotions, even our thoughts. And there's a whole bunch of different shadow archetypes that we're going to be getting into this class. And we naturally process and are and become all of those. <laughs> so you're going to get to know yourself. Why? Because then you know you're not alone, that you are actually a darker connected to the darker aspects of the soul. So shadow archetypes can be harmful to others, but it is up to us to decide how we want to use our power. We can either use our power for the good or for the ill, for the evil, for the negative. Well, we make those choices in everything we do and how we talk. So the key to shadow work and connecting to this amazing power, this divine, it is a divine power, is to become aware of our shadow side so that we can make more conscious choices about how we want to express our power in our world. And personally, I find it more helpful to think of the shadow terms in, in, in terms of balance, right? Or, or imbalance. So generally, our shadow sides, our shadow selves are a manifestation of things that are left unchecked, right? All the bucket lists that flip to the bucket list, right? That's how I see it. So we, when we go out of balance, our shadow selves arise, right? And it is a manifestation of the things that are unchecked or the things that have, we have allowed to go too far. Okay. Think about when you get into an argument and it goes too far. You feel that beast. Don't tell me you don't have one. It ain't no little puppy dog. 
Okay. Well, I, where did the shadow self idea originate, which I find fascinating because I do like psychology and I like people and I like the way the cultures and the minds think and all of those things put together is just fascinating. So the concept of the shadow self was actually created in the 1960s, not too long ago. And it was explored by this psychiatrist, Carl Jung. And he said, and if you don't know Carl Jung, you definitely need to look him up. He is, he is one of my favorite people to read and study. Anyway, he said, everybody carries a shadow. And the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, their daily life, the blacker and denser it is. So this is referring to the unconscious part of the human psyche. Okay, the self that is hidden from our own view. And when I say human psyche, I'm not talking about the spiritual psyche. We're talking about our daily life. Right. So that hidden that self that is hidden from our own view. It's not the self we sh show to the world or that we consciously show our friends or family or, or anybody. So within each person, we are a different being from the outside world. And I guarantee you, you're like freaking amazing in there just wanting to pop out. Okay. And the shadow self is the hidden part of our personality. If you hide it, the shadow comes out. If you don't express your feelings, the shadow comes out. So it's anything that is not expressed becomes part of the shadow. And our shadows can build. Like I said, I got a beast. Mine ain't no poodle. Okay. I, I swear I would be a crazy one. <laughs> I've been called that before. I'm sure we all have, right? That crazy word. I'm not the only one. <laughs> okay. So, so the shadow self is that hidden part and anything that we put inside becomes part of it. And our shadow side is one of the most important aspects of the self to work on especially when it comes to magic and divination, right? Because it constantly is working for us. Our shadow sides, our, our shadow selves actually are constantly working hard for us. It's helping us make sense of everything. And actually our shadow side is our karmic power at play. It is the result of everything we've done, everything we've experienced, everything we've thought, and everything we didn't do and more. That's our karmic power. It's not just the deeds. It's what we're holding inside. That's the regenerative power. And it's not meant to be scary because the shadow compels us to become transformed. It's the power in how we actually move forward. We can't move forward in our life without our shadow. It is meant to guide us and move us forward. So if there is a fear of the future, connecting to the shadow is a must. And when sir, we feel certain things in our life, that is our shadow being invoked. Our shadow is always 24-7 hunting, wanting something. So it does compel us to be transformed. And it's important, okay? Connecting to your shadow is super important. Think about right now in your life, what element is your shadow focusing on? Is it the earth? 
Are you focusing on material things? Are you focusing on like things that you need tangible or physical healing? Is it air? Is your shadow focusing on your future? Or is the, is the shadow focusing on the fire element? The present forces, the motives. Or is it the water element? Is your shadow focused on the past? It won't let go of the past. I can't release the past. Then it needs healing. And the spirit element is the mind. It's all of it. It's the conscious, it's the subconscious, and it's the superconscious. So our shadow self is our manifesting power. And that's how I want you to view it this week. Okay. So think about your instincts. What is it focusing on right now? Is it focusing on a person? Is it focusing on a situation, something you need to do? Is it focusing on yourself or someone else? What instincts? Who has who and where is that power? Because our shadow is manifesting our power. Our shadow's job is to prompt us whenever we need to protect ourselves, or whenever we need to learn something or do something. Our shadow self is connected to all the lessons of the past, the present, and the future. And when the shadow, the human shadow, is triggered, when it's activated, or when we're shunned, it will undermine us or sabotage our lives. And sometimes this leads to negative mental habits, which we all have and had. Okay. Addictions, low self esteem, mental illness, chronic illness. Right. There's all kinds of things that are attributed to an untamed, unconnected shadow self. So think about in your life, how often you hear something negative, how often your thoughts are negative. Okay. That is your shadow self. And that shadow self does not want to speak negatively. It's untamed. It wants to walk with you. So there is a power of knowing your shadow side. And that is what the workbook that I have made is all about. So I didn't get that into that in the beginning of the class. I'm like, I know I forgot something. Well, how about the entire introduction? <laughs> okay, so... I do want you to message me your mailing address because the workbook you're getting is like 175 pages or more. So it's huge. Okay. And that will be getting shipped out and you don't need the workbook to take this class, but you would want to kind of go through maybe the class a little bit um, while you're working on it, okay? So you do get that workbook. Nobody's getting it until you get it. So I wanted to make sure it was special for everyone in this class. So we do want to work on that. And the workbook is going to help us delve into, connect and honor that shadow aspect of ourself. I like to call it the dark aspect because to me, when I look at my dark aspect and, and sometimes, you know, we can be ugly, but it's like, it doesn't intimidate me. My darkness does not intimidate me because I know I'm a good person. So when I get set off, I know it's just a motivating power, right? I've learned to understand that. So I like calling it the dark aspect, right? The dark goddess aspect that comes through. And that's what it is, is honoring the dark aspect of yourself instead of feeling ashamed. Yes, we all felt ashamed, but feel ashamed for that moment and for that experience. Don't carry it on. Right. So instead of feeling ashamed, 
of the darker aspect of ourself, we can learn that we can trust it, that it's our trust in our abilities and our self. That's the whole aspect of the shadow self. But it's also a fear of our power, right? Many people have fear of their power. And that's one thing that I like to teach is you shouldn't. You, you are not, you know, you are not manifesting horrible things unless you are. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And being in touch with your shadow self, now you'll really believe in yourself. Because the first rule in magic is to know thyself, to honor yourself. Because when you know yourself, you know everything that is outside of yourself. And if it's outside of yourself, then it is not part of yourself, unless it is part of your higher self, which is only positive. Okay. So the shadow self wants us to trust in our instincts, in our abilities, in our earthly walk, our earthly path. And it, the power of the shadow self recognizes where we feel bound or where we feel stuck in life. So if our freedom feels confined, then we will fall into a darker place. This is a path where we actually do lose our minds because we start to feel imbalanced. As soon as we're out of our balance, we're either in our higher self or our lower self. So it is true when it's true power. This is about our personal transformation, a positive transformation. And one reason why self-care is so important because self-care motivates how we proceed, right? Our tomorrows are determined by our today's true self. So if we're a bitch today, <laughs> which holy cow, I you should have seen me doing working on my shadow self. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not trying to scare you. So we do have a light and a dark self. Okay. And the dark self, the shadow self, it is our experience of the outer world. The outer world that distracted us and took our natural formation, right? Our experiences with the world formed us and took away from our natural experience to into what we are, who we are, and where we are in our life, right? It creates a comparison. And for us to enter into our inner world, we must first make way through the outer world by dealing with falseness, our distractions and contradictions of who we actually are. Because once you know your shadow self and, and you're okay with it, you can walk your true authentic path. So our shadow self does not need consciousness to operate. Okay. Actually, it can become quite dangerous if it turns against us because it affects our well-being, it affects our mentality, our emotions, our physical body, our spirituality. So our shadow self actually has the power to kill the conscious self. You know, people can hear negative voices to the point where it becomes, you know, an imbalance right? Schizophrenia. So it's important to seek to know this aspect of us, for then it doesn't feel bound. Its job is to protect us and to help us adapt to our surroundings. It's a guide from within. It's our only guide from within, besides our chakra, right? Our chakra power, which it affects. So our shadow self is our ego, 
and the connection we have to the underworld, the self within the lower realms. Many people have experienced seeing shadow spirits, right? Have you ever been somewhere and you've seen like a shadow being? Well, that is the shadow spirit. When we go array and lose ourselves and we've all lost ourselves and pulled ourselves out of that big hole, right? We know it's a hole and we have to pull ourselves out of it. (laughs) But when we go array and lose ourselves, we create a heavy, dense spirit. The more negative, the more dense. And think about how many dense spirits we, we, you know, that have lived in our world and died, right? Like I said, if you, if you live your life as an asshole, you're an asshole in the spirit world. You know, you don't just all of a sudden grow wings. No, you're, you're still an asshole, right? But the imprint is a shadow, right? So when we see those shadows creatures, that's what it is. It's their shadow. It is a shadow creature. And it can be created by the human spirit. Darkness, but we can also use darkness in a positive way. Right? So darkness, using darkness in the right way, expands our imagination and our concepts of what is possible. So when we are working with our shadow and our shadow knows we're listening and it's that tamed puppy, (laughs) it will expand our imagination and the concepts of what is possible. Okay, so think about this. Many people can relate to this. Okay, we're going to sex Saturday night. No, just kidding. So (laughs) are you more comfortable having sex in the dark? Like, think about that. Are you more relaxed and imaginative, right? All of a sudden, your dude's like, Fabio. (laughs) Just kidding. But do you know what I mean? Right? We can relax. And we can go into an imaginative state. And that imaginative state is something that can give us ideas to create the life that we desire, okay? But we have to get into a place where our shadow feels like it's in that balanced state, wanting to work with our higher self, our light self. And we do have a light self. And our higher self and our and our lower self, they don't hate each other. They don't work against each other. They want to get to know each other. So the higher self is refer is referenced a lot, right? You've heard about, you know, you have a higher self and most of us have read or heard the line of connect to your higher self to become abundant and grounded and calmer. But at some point, right? What does a higher self really look like? How do we recognize when we're in our higher state or our lower state? Because we have both and we're connected to both 24-7. So our light self is our higher self. It's our divine self and it truly is divine. It will never, ever speak anything negative. It doesn't. It doesn't know negativity. And it guides us and it's connected to the higher realms of consciousness. It's pure spirit and it's only divine. It's actually a divine consciousness. And our higher self is connected to it. And we can tell when we're connected to it by feeling calm and centered. Because your higher self is the voice. That is meant to calm the ego. The ego speaks up. No, you can't do that. And the higher self says, yes, she sure can. And she's going to do it like with abundance. So our higher self is meant to calm the ego. Does it? 
think about that. Does your higher self actually calm your ego when it's speaking? Take note on that next time. The other thing we can tell is when we're connected to our higher self is we are compassionate. We actually care about what everybody thinks and want to take care and make sure that things are in balance. We're not sitting there with resentment. You know, people that you love, there's days like you just resent them. And other days you're like, oh, I love you so much. Okay, higher, lower self right there. <laughs> so when we're seeing our, our family and the people we care about, like we love them, you know, you're connected to your higher self. But when you're sitting there going, asshole, didn't clean up, you know, that is lower self. And it's okay to live in both. Like this class is not telling you to repress. It's telling you to be. The other thing is, is when we have long-term focus in our life, like when we're focusing on the next year, the next two years, the next three years, whenever we put anything in our, our vision that is future, long-term, we are connected to our divine self. And when we get win-win situations, it's like, yes, I'm in that flow. And things turn out our way. It's like, yes, thank you. You are connected to your higher self. And the other time you're connected to your higher self is when you hold your boundaries. And you're like, uh-uh, nope, nope. That was the hardest thing for me. You can ask anyone. I hate saying no. And I shouldn't have said that out loud. Okay, but saying no, I have to like go through a process. <laughs> okay, so our boundaries are actually connected to our higher self, right? The gate of our, we're the gatekeepers of our heaven. And when we feel positive, anytime we feel positive, we joy, laughter, that's all higher self connection. Okay. So we all have those little voices in our heads that speak to us when we're seeking guidance. But we also have the voices in us that feed us doubt and fear. So those voices come from two very different sources, our higher self and our lower self. And there's some guidelines that will help you determine which voice that you're listening to. Okay. And, and remember, they're opposites. So the higher and the lower self are opposites. We're the one in between, right? So the higher self is loving, where the lower self is jealous, right? Or the higher self is confident, and the lower self is insecure. The higher self feels fulfilled, and the lower self is like, I don't have it right? I mean, that happens to me. I'm like, oh, my life is wonderful. I love it. And I'm like, I need to get out of here and go on a vacation. <laughs> okay. So I think that's my higher self telling me go on vacation too, right? But <laughs> whatever, right? Fulfilling is important in our life to feel fulfilled, to be on the path of fulfilling. So when we are in a place where we're lacking, or we feel like it's blocking that path to fulfillment, our lower self comes up. Our higher self urges us to fulfill our purpose, where our lower self wants us to delay our purpose, right? Our higher self wants to have that win-win where our lower self wants the competition, right? They still want to win, but it's all about the competition, right? Our higher self is secure in relationships, where our lower self fears abandonment. Our higher self has a clear conscience. And our lower self will feel guilty. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good thing, though, right? It is guided, our higher self is guided by actions where our lower self will try to find that game, right? And try to seek manipulation if it's untamed, right? Our higher self is always consistent where our lower self is inconsistent. 
our higher self makes us feel warm and protected. And our other lower self makes us feel cold and prickly. So if you're like freezing for a week, that's a sign that your lower self is in play. Okay. Our uh, higher self has a positive voice. And it can even be warming to you where our lower self is like demanding. <laughs> okay. Can be also grumpy or short, right? Um, our higher self is generous where our lower self is protective or even greedy, right? Our higher self is like secure in their footing where our lower self becomes clumsy, so clumsiness, I know some of you are clumsy, I'm not going to say any names. <laughs> and one's <laughs> so lower self, right? Oh, my shadow side's active, right? And so I asked you, have you met your shadow self? Well, sh when you support yourself, the universe will help you. So it's really important for us to meet and look at our shadow self because it can actually set us free. And ultimately, our goal is to integrate the shadow parts and to stop rejecting parts of our personality, the parts that we hate or the parts we're ashamed of or the parts we're upset about or that we feel embarrassed by. We do need to heal these parts. And we heal these parts by bringing these parts forward into our everyday lives, but also into the light. By just being authentic and knowing it's okay to be that way and feel supported just by being you. So I am inviting you to examine and own these parts within yourself. And this is for your own peace. This, is, this course is not to put you into a state where you're not finding peace. And that's what I'm excited about. Because I know you'll have each and own personal enlightenment. Okay, so I, I would like to know what you think of, of what you go through or, or the course as you're doing it. Okay, so this is about you and having the freedom. So when we get triggered, our natural re reaction is to blame the person who triggered us, right? And react outwardly, right? And I, I'm like, super quick. But if we heal... Okay, when we choose to stop projecting our hurt onto others and take a look inside, we are not ignoring our shadow. So we don't want to ignore our shadow. The effects of ignoring our shadow is not good. When we ignore it, our shadow finds ways to make us aware that it exists. Okay, chaos. Like as soon as chaos comes up in my life, I'm like, oh, I know. Okay, I got to pay attention to myself. <laughs> okay. Or self-loathing. Okay, like when we ignore it, some of these things we're going we're gonna to experience. Self-loathing. Poor self-esteem. Self-deceit. Right? All of a sudden we have all these excuses. Or deceiving others. And we definitely experience anxiety and depression. So the moment we start to feel stress, that is going to call our shadow forward. Offensive behavior. Whenever we experience offensive behavior, especially towards others, you know, it's a like game on. I'm going to protect them, right? Or if we're struggling to have healthy relationships, with others. Okay. Self sabotage, that is an untamed beast in there. Right. You have all of these opportunities, and then all of a sudden you just screw yourself right out of them. It's like shutting the door to the universe. And it's like, oh my God, I shouldn't have done it. Right. Self absorption and an inflated ego. Do you know someone that's got an inflated ego? Like, oh my God, shadow all the way around. <laughs> um, 
my my thing i got a little bit of an ego i love it okay <laughs> oh i have to keep my beast happy i even have a furry pillow just to pet it to make sure that my beast knows that i like it okay so overreactions is another thing when we overreact our shadow comes forward it wants to express itself especially if we don't know how to react think about the last time you overreacted and how you acted our overreactions create action reaction right like it's right in the word and that means it's actually got to do with something that has occurred before. So our reactions or our overreactions are part of a pattern. And our overreactions also create energies and impressions. So whenever we overreact, how do you make other people feel? It's really important to know what power you're dishing out and to understand it. And once you understand it, try to explain it out loud to hear what the other person would hear. I honestly did not realize how hardcore I was. <laughs> okay. So I, I had to back it up. And then all of a sudden, you know, years later, I'm watching this reality show. And I said to Brett, man, these reality shows, these, these women are just like, crazy i'm like i can now step it up a notch i can you know bitch it up <laughs> i'm too nice now <laughs> right so we can uh so our overreactions do create the energies and impressions that we don't want and so try to it's one way to to handle that is try to explain out loud and try to hear what the other person would hear like rationalize the situation. And you may have to do this until you actually find an honest explanation that you can use as a tool for when you do overreact. Like pre-plan your overreaction. <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, so that you're comfortable with it and you just like, it becomes a rule. Nope. I'm going to react. I'm leaving. Right. Just don't leave your, you don't want to leave your negative reactions left because it will grow and it will return to us threefold because our shadow is part of our karma right and grudges right we've all held a grudge against someone but not dealing with them can actually have consequences so it's important for us to recognize the people we hold grudges against and when they do come up in our life like why do you hold a grudge against them Think about the grudge from the other person's point of view. Like, do you, they know you hold a grudge or is it all repressed, right? Do you think they hold a grudge against you? Like, is this a mirrored effect? And what energy is this grudge creating? Is it hurtful? Are you angry? What kind of a repressed emotions is it blocking and putting inside of you? Are you the hurt one or are they? So you do want to get rid of grudges. Make it a personal rule that you won't hold on to them. You don't want a negative attachment. Cut the cord because it does cause you more negativity. And nobody sees the things that you do in the same way. That's what's unique about us, right? We can all look at the same blue in the sky, but it's actually a different color of blue to all of us. So we need to understand that grudges only create negative attachments that create a cycle. And this form will eventually become a negative pattern, but also a very skewed perception that will build and build into a distraction from your actual path and your actual connection to the people that you're holding grudges against, okay? So one thing that I do want to talk about is the shadow's intuition. I love the shadow. I love the intuition. 
So doing shadow work can be very healing in every way. We can learn how to release and restore. And doing shadow work will also give you a more motivating power and help you become more intuitive. So we step into our power and become stronger and more confident in walking authentically. Like imagine just being you for an entire day and nothing pokes you, <laughs> right? Our pace is our freedom. The pace that we walk in our day is our freedom. And it's also our motivating power and magic that is hidden and unseen. And it works quite beautifully with our higher self. It's our masculine and feminine power and harmony. So my shadow self knows what I want. And it helps me guide me to those things that I seek in my life. But if you have to want, like if, but if you, but you do have to want things in your life, you have to have something that your beast can go after, something that the shadow self can feel proud of bringing forth to you. And that's what its job is. Okay. So when we take a look at our feelings, okay, let's talk about that, our, sh our shadow's intuition. So we have our intuitive pathways, okay? We have the clairsentience, which is our clear feeling, our psychic feeling. Psychic feelings are clear. That's why it's clear feeling. Well, when our clear feeling, when our psychic feelings or when our feelings don't matter, our beast rises. So our clairsentience, our psychic self needs to feel. And if we do not feel or if our feelings don't matter, our psychic beast that feels comes forward okay who is invoking that you want to take note on who's invoking these energies in you right when we are not being heard so our psychic self when it comes to our clairvoyance our psychic hearing if we are not being heard our psychic self comes forward, the beast. The beast has to be heard, okay? So when your partner's not listening to you or your mother's not listening to you, okay? We are invoking our beast, okay? Who's invoking that beast, right? When we aren't being seen, so when people can't see us for who we are, that invokes our beast. When we are not being seen the way we feel we should be seen, our beast comes forward. Okay, that's what it wants. It wants to be seen. When we know that there is a disconnect, right? But when we experience more than one of these triggers together, then it's really bad. If our beast doesn't feel like we are being heard or seen or felt, activate, activate power. Okay. That's, that's like super, super beast coming forward. Right? Not just one aspect of the beast that doesn't feel like they're seen, but now they don't feel seen. They don't feel heard. They don't feel felt or, uh, you know, they don't know. They're totally disconnected. All of our psychic pathways become overshadowed. And it puts us into beast mode. Our shadow is invoked with our psychic pathways being dishonored 
by what we are experiencing through ourselves or because of others or situations or whatever we pick up. So our shadow is our psychic protection, right? So when you are being invoked, who is it? What's the situation? Why? Why is your shadow being invoked? And where are you? So knowing why these things are being invoked is part of your mastery. And as these things are getting invoked on a psychic level, they're also infecting our body, mind, and spirit because that energy is through all of our chakras, right? It's going through our auric body, 12 light bodies, right? Activated by the shadow. So it is important for us to banish things that we don't like, protect ourselves from things we don't like, to keep ourselves pure, but also keep creating. We have to be in a place of creation. And let's not talk about, I forgot to talk about the psychic smell or the psychic touch, taste, okay? So when you actually miss and it's like, oh my God, I, I, my feelings haven't been heard today. Nobody's like getting it. And you're feeling alone. Like nobody's getting you. If you have more than one of those things going on, all of a sudden your taste goes off or your smell goes off. We need to feed the shadow. Your shadow will start to our food cravings. I need chips. I need diet Pepsi. Okay. That's my shadow. <laughs> That's like, it's telling me your craving, any type of food craving represents your shadow side active, right? Which also represents you need to connect to that element, right? The What element is it, right? So how do we feed the shadow? Well, we feed the shadow by our cravings, right? I if, if I crave something, I feed it. I do not believe in starving my shadow, okay? If my shadow wants something, I'll make it, okay? I'll find a way. Um, you're, we also feed our shadow through our day, how we are in our day, right? Or our perceptions. The things we focus on today will be manifesting for tomorrow. That's why you don't want to focus on other people. You want to focus on your life, right? So our shadow is our perception unless we are actually tapped into our higher self or in a neutral place. And our perception is everything. So when we are seeing through our eyes, that's our beast. When we are tapping into, you know, divination, then we tap into our higher self. But our worldly life is more connected to our shadow self. And perception is everything. So our discomfort should represent growth. If you're, if you're uncomfortable in your life, then there's still growth. You're still growing. Seek it. If you have problems, then we need to look at them like challenges. Problems and challenges are two different things. Okay. When we think of rejection, that means we need to look at our direction, right? Redirect. Rejection means go the other way, right? Uh, our triggers. All of our triggers reveal wounds. So if someone triggers us, that's a wound, right? They just picked the scab right off, right? Some people will pick that scab off and eat it. So our triggers reveal <laughs> wounds, I had to say that. Um, our darkness reveals our light. Our failures are our lessons, our fears are our teachers, right? Fears are my like number one thing. I feel a fear and I'm like, yes, 
It's purpose. I'm doing it. Unless they're like, Georgina, I'll kill you. Don't do it. Don't jump off a plane. Right. Then I, I would obviously follow that. Um, <laughs> our pain is, <laughs> is meant to be our power, right? Our pain, we have to overcome. How do we overcome our pain? Freaking willpower. Okay. Somehow, whether it's our healing ability or minds or the medicine, right? We are overpowering the pain. Okay. Well, our shadow represents every aspect of us, our mental side, our emotional side, our spiritual side, as well as our, our physical side. So anything that we experience that is discomfort, we can actually tap into the power of our shadow side for healing. Okay. So same with triggers. We all have our triggers, but that puts us in different moods and different states of being. And understanding our triggers can help us deal with them as they are invoked in that moment right? So knowing what your triggers are, are important. Don't let it surprise you every time it comes up, but it's been coming up for the last 20 years, right? But every time it comes up, you're surprised, right? No, know what your triggers are. Think about them. And what are they doing? What are these things that trigger you, right? Look for the traits in others that trigger your feelings, because they are feelings of inferiority for ourselves, right? A trigger is when someone or something outside of us gets us angry or they get their hooks on us, right? And it's like, oh, it's imprinted. But triggers aren't actually about the person pushing our buttons. They're about us. The person or the situation that triggers us is, you know, reflecting an unhealed, unconscious wound that we already have. So a sense of moral inferiority indicates that we're missing an element to something. And that's why we judge and have feelings towards it. It's because there's something missing. So what is it that could be made conscious for you? right? What is that sense of moral inferiority that you need to recognize, right? And assimilate it, make it an, a, a possibility of what it is that you're creating. That's part of your morals, right? There's a key to that. And I want to go into, um, so Think about your intuition and how it works positively and negatively and honor it that way. But I do want to go into, I don't know if I want to end at this. It's victimhood. Do I end at this or should I go forward? Uh, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to move forward. I know some of you are like, pass the victimhood. <laughs> I know. So I want to go into it and then we don't have to next class, <laughs> but we all have been victim to someone. Okay. Maybe it was family. Maybe it was bullies. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe it was from being made fun of to being seriously abused. Maybe you're a victim a few times. Maybe you're a victim all the time. Okay. But everyone can relate to being a victim and we love to root for the underdog, right? The, the disadvantage. And there's nothing wrong with that because this hidden aspect is hidden within the victim is the victory. And I believe part of our fascination with feeling this victim archetype is part of our psyche, but there's also attachment to it. And that attachment is the desire for transformation and personal empowerment that actually comes from the victim becoming the victor. So the root of the victim archetype is fear. And it's that we cannot survive or will not survive, not just physical survival, 
but survival of our identity, our hopes and our dreams, our sense of self. And deep down, there's a belief that you don't deserve to thrive. And the victim is a way to have passive control over our life, right? And we need to get rid of that. All victims are entitled. And it may take you some time to see your own sense of entitlement, but it's important to identify it to be able to transform this interesting archetype from our shadow to light. And that's working through the victim, which may be the most difficult thing you've ever done, but it is the most life altering thing as well. It is possible to be a victim without there being a villain too. Your villain may be something as simple as your work schedule or seasonal allergies, but it doesn't take long for the victim to perceive the situation. And there's extreme examples of victims and villains, such as prisoners of war and captures to chair child and abusive parents, right? Or the jailer and the convict. But the dynamics between them are the same. One, the villain has a power, and the other, the victim, is powerless and at the mercy of the other. And recognizing the villain is important as recognizing your victimization. And here's like here's a, a, a sample of some of the things that we can feel victimized by, right? Motherhood or fatherhood, feeling like a victim to your children and their care as though you have no choice, right? Think about our illnesses or our injuries. Oh my God, that's a common one, right? We feel victim to our body. Like, how can we not, <laughs> right? So feeling like we have no control over our body, right? But we have to initiate that our body will heal or that your body has failed us, right? We carry that. And we're like, oh my God, my body has failed us, failed me. And you can't come to terms with it. We all have that, okay, in some way, okay? I can pinch a few areas. It's insomnia, not getting sleep, and allergies. Those are actually two more common villains that many people have to deal with. The lack of control that these issues cause, right? This can cause a normal person into instant victimization. I'm not sleeping. I haven't slept for a week, right? Money is another villain for many people. The lack of money, feeling victimized by the debt collectors or feeling like you don't make enough money that you deserve, right? Those are samples or examples of how you may feel victimized by the lack of money. Or on the flip side, you might feel like your wealth is a burden. I wish, but if, if you may wish that your wealth is a burden and you may fit to be victimized by how, there, how others expect you to help them, right? That you have loads of money. Your relationship to money is a great place to observe your victimhood. Are you a victim financially? Our jobs too. Our jobs can be a source of victimization. We can feel unhappy or abused in the job and feel powerless that we can't change our situation. We believe that our financial security comes from the job or career as an example. So we feel victimized by our job. Maybe our C maybe we're the you know CEO of our own company. So we may find ourselves a victim to others' expectations and demands and paying employees before ourselves, or, or even the victim to other people's perception of your role or your business. Another interesting one nowadays, gender. I don't even want to go into that topic because I don't even know all the words for everything I'm supposed to use, and that's honest. But you can feel victimized by being a woman or a man, and especially by the roles that, you know, over-cultural expects of a man or a woman, 
right? Like this victimization can be seen in many areas today on TV, stereotypes are all over. It's amplified, it's highlighted, right? Education, that's a source of victimization. You may feel like you have to be controlled by the system of education that decides what hoops you must leap in order to get a degree to do what you want, or that the law demands you to go to school if you're a younger person, right? Religion and, and organization, right? Relig religion and their organizations feel victimizing, because of their expectations and demands that many religious organizations require the person to be a good person, right? This is true. Like the, the organizations do that. They have the, the stakes are higher because your soul or personal salvation is on the line, right? Another one is the villain that is our body right? Appearance of the body, feeling like you're overweight, aging, you know, genetic inheritances, blaming, even when it's done, and we're still giving power to it. And we cannot, right? We can feel like a victim in our country because of our country's government or the law to another one. Maybe you feel like the law is unjust and we're a victim to that. Or we are justified in complaining in all of the extreme cases, you know, the custody battles or losing a child and the hungry and the everything that's out there. We can grow resentful toward the, our country and our law, right? Or the expectations of our culture and the stereotypes, right, can be a real means to fall in victimization. If you're from another country, you may feel shame about your heritage, or you may be trying to fit in when it goes against who you are. So this can cause you to feel like a victim on how, how others precede you. Think about our fate, right? Many people have resigned themselves to sorrow fate, feeling like a victim of fate, believing that they're unable to have any other control over their destinies. Ideas about predestination and everything that happens was pre-planned and it is going to take away responsibility. And one of the key aspects to the victim is the avoidance of personal responsibility, right? So villains and perhaps the most powerful of all villains is our thoughts our emotions, and our fears. And these inner perpetrators can have more power to victimize than all the other villains that I just talked about. Okay? So enabling and, and victimization go well together. And in most relationships where there's a strong victim, there will also be an enabler nearby ready to reinforce the victim's victimization. So many victims will seek out enablers to keep the victim feeling justified and entitled. And enablers do enjoy their role because it guarantees that the victim will be needing them and they will have the loyalty and acceptance of the victim as well as the cultural nod of approval for your support of the victim. So if you're not sure about your victim and the mask it wears, just notice the enabler in your life. Enablers are easy to spot because they're the person you seek out when you want someone to sympath 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 sympathize <laughs> with your struggle. And they encourage that sense of the victim being wronged. So enablers enjoy the attention and being special. And perhaps they are the only one the victim can talk to. So enablers are simply victims in disguise. This trap of approval can keep 
the enabler as blind as a victim. So the victim is a perpetrator. And when we're feeling victimized, we are almost always in the act of victimizing someone else simultaneously. Like, for example, if you feel ill and you're feeling victimized by your your illness, you tend to complain, you're suffering loudly, right? We all do this. And this can victimize others. And then when you make your illness a center of attention and nothing can be more important and others feel overlooked, right? Another example is when you're feeling like a victim and you withdraw from others. I mean, this can be painful to your loved ones. And that is a form of victimization for them, right? Expectations and obligations create victims. When you have unmet expectations, we feel victimized by a failed expectation. It wasn't supposed to rain today. The weather said there wasn't going to be some rain, right? Or, or when you feel obligated to do something and you don't want to. How often do you do that? That turns into victimization. The vicious cycle of victim to perpetrator, then back to victim, is a painful realization because the victim needs to feel innocent and blameless to maintain their victim status. Unless, of course, you've turned your sense of powerless into self victimization. And self victimization is victimizing the self. And it is a sneaky way of being a victim without being obvious. <laughs> but the pattern is identical to that of any other victim or villain relationship. You can victimize yourself by beating yourself up, by speaking harshly and regarding yourself with negativity or self-loathing. You will not accept praise from others easily or be willing to look at your own success and personal empowerment without having a secret dagger used to stab yourself in the back. What one gains by victiming their self? Entitlement. Of all the victim dynamics, okay? Self-victimization is the strongest element of entitlement. And there is a deep unconscious belief that the self-abuse the victim regularly inflicts is a great big entitlement ribbon. Okay. I have suffered too much, right? I am entitled to my unhappiness, my grief, my depression, my pain. My revenge. This sort of entitlement can be so difficult to spot that many who self victimize are unaware of this entitlement. And the victim says, I will never have what I need unless you, or unless they, or unless it, right? Self victimization says, I will never have what I need and want because there's something wrong with me or therefore, right? And that gives you the entitlement to complain, to remain stuck, to impose your suffering. I mean, we all do it. We, I, what I'm talking about is a natural thing. So even though you may be like, oh my God, it's so much of what I do. We do it all the time, but we need to be aware of it. So don't go into a place where you're like, oh my God, <laughs> Go into a place where you actually are recognizing it so that you can catch it. Because this is something that's part of our psyche, our darker self. And, and in the next class, you'll learn more about that because we actually experience it two, month, two weeks out of every single month. Our shadow self is in power. Okay. So you do want to see it. You do want to see, you know, that all of this gives us the entitlement to complain or remain stuck or imp impose our suffering on ourselves or others or to reject the things that are offered to us. 
self-victimization destroys the blessings that we should be receiving, right? Self-victimization is the ultimate example of the victim perpetrator dynamic as how you see as painful as it is on both ends. And you don't have to look very far to find, you know, the examples of this archetype. We all are connected to that archetype. And it is important for us to identify the short, the sort of victim that we are relating to mostly on our way and the method of entitlement that goes with the victim. So there's many different variants of the victim. And I know that we're 15 minutes over, but I can't leave you with just that. I have to finish this part. And then we'll go on to next class. So the victim has been around for so long that there are many expressions of the victim. So I'm going to touch on a few of them, and hopefully you'll be able to identify one or two within yourself, and hopefully it will help you discover a way to the way that you're, that you work, right? Most of us can be quite unaware of what the victim looks like in me, right? In you, right? Well, finding it easy to spot it in others. So I want to go through this list and see if you can see yourself in any of them. And you don't have to put it on there. That's me. Okay, just reflect. So the patient, the patient is one. The victim to your health or lack of right? The victim to our bodily functions, our injuries, right? And the entitlement to feel healthy. Like we should all be, I believe we should all be able to be healthy, right? To be healed and to have someone else responsible for our health and healing. Maybe a doctor, Maybe the angels or the universe. I'm like, universe is my doctor. Come on. It should also, uh, it's also common to place the blame on the doctors when things go wrong, right? Oh, the prisoner. Oh my God. The prisoner, victim to someone else's desire, right? their manipulation, their demands and control, they're entitled, right? Or entitled to their revenge or their negative moods all the time or their anger. So being a victim to someone else's energies. And then there's the long sufferer. The long sufferer is when we fall victim to circumstances and others' actions. Like, that sucks. So, you know, complaining in the support of others and things that they've done. And it's like, if this, if they didn't do that, I could have done this. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? How many times have you said it, right? The robot. The robot is a victim. Victim to internal programming and stories. We are entitled to being disconnected, judgmental, and superior. Right? I always tell people, go through your, your self-rules and break some of those. Because some of those rules you have on yourself, I don't like going here. Well, maybe that's where you should be going. <laughs> right? I want to meet a woman, but I won't leave my house. Maybe you need to leave your house, right? So the robot, they're victim to this internal program that they created their own rules, right? Look at religion and their rules, internal programming and the stories that they have. Then there's a weakling, victim to external demands, victim to the belief that you're helpless, you're overwhelmed, right? You don't have the ability to do it. We're entitled to inaction. I'm a woman, <laughs> right? Confusion or even fear, 
advice and help, right? We want help. Then there's a crusader and the crusader is a victim of loneliness, negativity, and self-hatred. And they're entitled to recruit others into being victims and victimizing those that they believe to be deserve believed deserved to be punished. So they're the doomsayers. They're the ones that say everything is wrong. Well, the world is fucked up. And that's it. <laughs> then there's the doormat. The doormat is a victim to being taken advantage of, overworked, used and abused. But they're entitled to love, support, acceptance, approval, and friendship. Then there's the hider. And they're victim to their lack of confidence or their own inadequate. So they're entitled to withdraw or hide. They're hiding their true feelings, but yet they're judging others. Right. Or they they have they want others to understand them, but they have to read their mind. <laughs> right. The dummy. The dummy victim. Mm hmm. I know I see it. No, you can't say that. Uh huh. I sure can. There's a dummy victim who perceives the lack of intelligence and the mental acuteness. So they're entitled to be uninformed blameless and irresponsible oh i can't do that i don't do numbers you're gonna have to do them right like just dishing it off i can't do that acting you know i said i i'm gonna start acting dumb i said i actually should go into the dummy victim and be dumber than i am maybe life will be easier <laughs> if i wasn't so smart <laughs> Okay, the cohort or accomplice, victim to others' influences, their pressure and manipulation, right? And they get that finger-pointed energy. There's the user, where we're victim to users. We're victim to scarcity, the things that they want, right? Maybe even robbery. When we get robbed or ripped off, we are being victimized by a user, right? Even high gas prices, to me, that's a victim to scarcity, the user, right? Uh, the righteous victim who turns trials and tribulations and misfortunes where we really need respect and rewards and compliments. So with those ideas, you can see how these archetypes influence the way our personal victimhood is actually expressed, like how it expresses itself, while there's other variants. So hopefully that list will help you identify which shadow victim hood is in play, right? And then you can help yourself through that. And all of those things are, are an aspect of life, okay? So now that I've covered all of these behaviors of the shadow victim, there's, you know, other symptoms that will make it easier for us to realize when we have fallen victim to the shadow aspect. Okay. And these, this is what I'm leaving you with tonight. So there's behavior. Okay. Behavior of no energy or a strong draw towards addictive behaviors. Right. I have no energy. I need a smoke. <laughs> Okay, constant need to distract yourself, blaming yourself or others, complaining often and loudly. 
as well as withdrawing from others, right? In all of a sudden, inaction, all of those. And our emotions, our emotions is when we feel angry or frustrated or hurt or depressed, right? We feel guilty, shameful. We, our emotions have fallen victim into shadow world. We feel worthless or hated. And these feelings are all clues to understanding how to transform yourself. Okay. Where the top one, when I discussed behavior, the action towards it would be taking control. That there is a place that you need to take control and dominate your behavior. And this one is understanding how to transform your emotions from the shadow. And then there's the shadow victim storyline where it's not my fault or it's all my fault. I'm always getting hurt. No one really understands me. I didn't have a choice. What am I supposed to do? This always happens to me. <laughs> okay. And so on. So you do want to pay attention to those things and know that the victim, the shadow victim always has expectations. So what is the expectation that you want? Is it maybe it's an expectation of others or yourself? Okay. And that's where it's moving into. So we're going to stop there at expectations. And I'm not going to give you any homework because I will be sending out your shadow books. And next class, we're going to delve into a lot more. So listen to this again and just try to pay attention to yourself. Be aware of your light and dark. You're not going to fall into any type of negativity. But you do want to listen to the psyche that's within. And some of the exercises you're going to get in this workbook will get that psyche talking to you in the in a way that you want it to. Okay, so just be uh, for this week. Um, we're going to meet again on the seventeenth. Um, for this week, just be aware. Just listen to your voices, the negative and the positive. Just listen. Okay, so I want to pull a card on our shadow selves. And see what we get. And I think that I think that we're going to be what the shadow self. I think the next class is before the new moon. So I was hoping for that. So the new moon is the shadows moon. That's why it's the dark moon. And I'm going to get into moon magic with the shadow next class as well and give you some things to practice. So this week, I want, okay, this week, give me three cards on our shadow self. What is in play? What does our shadow want? Ready? Psychic abilities. I love that. Because people don't realize that our psychic abilities are not just like, you know, higher self. It's also the lower self, right? A lot of the spirits that I communicate with, they're not all like floating angels with wings. They're in this realm. They're in the spirit realm, right? So our, uh, we, can, we can definitely connect to anybody, but your psychic abilities in the shadow are going to be in play this week. Doing what? Focusing on our well-being. That's what this is all about. Okay. Understanding that aspect. That looks like a rebirthing card too. And willpower. Okay. So also having the strength to recognize, oh, I'm going into shadow mode. Right. Sometimes you want to, but most of the times... You want to carry it through, not push it back in, right? So I'm going to leave you with that.
into all of the different um, variants of the victim. I think that's where we ended. And I'm sure that as we were going through them, you would recognize different ones that we've experienced and as well as what other people have experienced that we love. So I do want to uh, go a little bit more into this uh, and move along. So let's go back into the shadow victim. Okay. And we have learned from the last class that the other archetype influences the way our personal victimhood expresses itself. And while there are many other variants, there's thousands of variants, actually. What I've covered is just a few. Um, the list that we put together and went through last class will help you identify when we are experiencing this inside, um, as well as being aware of it when other people are experiencing it. So while we've covered these behaviors, there are some general symptoms. And I want to discuss these symptoms so that it's easier for you to realize when you've fallen into the shadow aspect of that victim, okay? Behavior that we will experience, no energy, okay? <laughs> like, when I fall into my shadow victim behavior, no energy. I have none. Like, don't even ask me to do something. I could be in it in days. We allow ourselves to go through it, right? Um, so we, for behavior, we'll, we'll have no energy or we'll have a strong to, a draw towards addictive behaviors, okay? Shadow tonight? Oh, what do I have? Oh, Baileys and milk, right? <laughs> so sometimes our shadow self will crave things, okay? Um, and it de definitely does draw addictive behaviors. Um, also, the constant need to distract yourself. That is a shadow behavior where you have to keep yourself distracted or you're blaming yourself or you're blaming others. So blaming <laughs> complaining often and loudly, withdrawing from others. Uh, a lot of times we'll go toward inaction or we'll go into a place of domination and control. <laughs> I'm like, yep, check, 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 check. Uh, our shadow emotions we will experience feeling angry, frustrated, hurt, depressed, guilty, shameful, worthless, or we go into a place of hatred. And these feelings are clues to understanding how to transform our shadow self, right? We also have a storyline. So we have a behavior, we have an emotion, and then the shadow victim will put a story behind it, right? It's not my fault, or it's all my fault, or I'm always getting hurt, or no one really understands me. I didn't have a choice. What am I supposed to do, <laughs> right? This always happens to me, and so on. My son, he even says that we have, like, this Gibson curse, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so those are some of the things that we will experience. And when we catch ourselves doing that, it is a sign that our, our shadow self is in play. It feels victimized in some reason. And the shadow victim always has expectations. So if all of a sudden we're feeling a certain way, it's because there's some kind of expectation that we either have on ourselves or others that we can't meet, right? And we've lost our boundaries of self-protection so we lash out like we're this cornered animal or our beast. I love calling mine. My shadow is definitely a beast. And when that doesn't work, we pull in and we invert, invert our strong emotions that's associated with the shadow victim into a deep place or go into a deep depression or, or 
whatever isolation or however we do, but it takes a lot of weight and heaviness to hold down all of those emotions that come from the anger and that comes from the feelings or the hurt of victimization. And this weight is a burden of the shadow. Okay. It's the shadows depression. So our shadow can actually go into a state of depression. And this depression usually alternates between some kind of eruption of strong emotions that's followed by depression, right? So if we have our big, strong emotions and we have our freak attack, okay? <laughs> I think the village can hear mine when I freak. Uh, and then go into a depression that is actually the cycle of the shadow victim. And a lot of things will trigger them. Letdowns, right? Letdowns can greatly affect our well being. And one of the most powerful affirmations that uh, I believe in, which I try to hold, but you'll even, those that know me personally, it's on my little about me thing. And it is I do not expect anything from others. So their actions cannot be in opposition to wishes of mine. And that's kind of hard to live by when you do have expectations of others and you're constantly fighting that shadow. But if you can go into a place where you don't expect anything from others, so their actions cannot be in opposition to yours, to the wishes of you want, then you can celebrate more victories, right? Or you can accept disappointment when it comes. Either way, we need to surrender to whatever it is that we're experiencing, but we have to keep our faith strong and learn to accept what it is. So the shadow victim has become disconnected from our personal worth, right? We lose touch of our, uh, our, interest, our intranistic self. All of a sudden, we are placed into a place such as a victim, right? As a victim, if the culture devaluates who we are, we devaluate our behavior or we accept this opinion that's about us. So then we belong to that. Or we're blame and we're blaming outside uh, forces or other people, even our own body for how we feel and what happened to us is a response of feeling worthless and powerless feeling stuck, when we're feeling separated from others and alienated from what we believe will make us happy. That whole is a common complaint of the shadow. And it only feeds into the belief that we are, you know, worthless or un undeserving. And when we believe that we are, we stop trusting ourselves. Like, do you realize we, that's how we stop trusting in ourself. We all of a sudden deepen the separation and the sense that we are no longer belonging or worthy or deserving. And this creates an emptiness. And this emptiness and loss causes the shadow victim to become more involved in the things that it's been feeling whether that's fear or addictions or whatever it is that is manifesting from this but the shadow's victim power is frozen in time and it takes us to look backwards to find the moment that we gave up in our power right so challenging the shadow isn't a small thing because this energy is very powerful. And when our shadow is in a place of victimhood, we're even in more power. And the shadow, this power, is being experienced as the power to disempower. The shadow victim is an expression of the root chakra wound, right? Think of our insecurity, right? Who we are. 
So this root wound where survival and the need to belong predominates. So chakra work is actually very powerful to keep ourselves in balance. Our meridian is connected to our inner and outer worlds, right? So fear is a strong motivator for survival. And it is a feature of the shadow victim, right? Fear-based information feeds the shadow victim and causes you to look outside of yourself for comfort, for answers, for support, for help, for empowerment. And when you look outside of yourself for the answer, your awareness diminishes and your consciousness lowers. And the shadow victim encourages us to be afraid of this change in uncertainty. And this causes two reactions. Domination, which is a proactive control, or helplessness, which is a passive control. And both reactions prevent the transformation of the victim archetype. So the challenge for the victim is this, should I give up my power in exchange for not being at fault? Or can I take the responsibility for what is happening to me and recognize the power that I do have? So we want to go into the next stage, which is the enlightened victim, right? Feel the fear. We all have fears. And when I learned to love my fears, and even though I have fears, don't get me wrong, I still have fear of heights. Now I have fear of flying, even though I used to love going places, <laughs> right? So we will invoke and fight different fears all the time, right? We need to feel the fear. We all have fears. And where your fear is, there is your task. Fear of success. What's your task, right? Fear of speaking, what's your task? So a good way to begin transforming the shadow victim into the enlightened victim is to feel the fear and do it anyway. And that was one of my biggest enlightenments in my life is why do I have this fear that speaks to me? Why does my fear say, no, you can't do that when I know I can? Why is it speaking? And for me, listening to my shadow and these fears put me into a place where I realized that it's untamed energy, that there's no reason why it wouldn't speak if it wasn't important, right? So, so for me, it was a sign. I turned it into a sign that this is important because I hear fear and fear doesn't exist. So I would do it anyway, right? Like in The Wizard of Oz, all of the main characters are representations of the shadow victim in various forms. You have Dorothy as the long sufferer, right? Who is blameless and uninformed. The tin man, the robot, disconnected and judgmental, the cowardly lion, weakling who is unwilling to act and full of fear, the wicked witch of the West, right? The crusader where she recruits others, the flying monkeys to do her bidden and wants to victimize others and feels entitled to the ruby slippers. And the wizard is righteous, feeling misunderstood, and seeks fame of importance to cover up his insecurities. And being afraid and not running from fear is the first step to transforming ourselves and to transforming the victim, whether that victimhood is in our present life now or in our past, right? But we can find our personal power in that. And the enlightened victim understands that real power comes from within and it's bound up with personal responsibility. So when you are the enlightened victim, you can't blame others because you can see that the loss of power happens from within. It would be useless to look for empowerment where it doesn't exist. So the enlightened victim asks, what can I do with the situation that I have been given? There is a great scene 
when you look at uh, and watch the Lord of the Rings, right, where Frodo is feeling victimized by the fact that the ring of power has come to him, right? And he says to Gandalf, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. And Gandalf said to him wisely, so do all who live and see such times. But that is not for them to decide. We all have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil, right? Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you were also meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. And that's where Gandalf shows Frodo where his true power lies, that there are some things in life that are not for us to decide. But when we decide what to do with what we have been given or what has happened to us, it is a very encouraging thought. And sometimes we're not aware of how powerful we are or how much control we have in our lives. Sometimes being, you know, thoroughly victimized and will allow us to see where our real sources of power is inside of ourselves, right? And that's our human freedom. Human freedom is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance to choose one's own way. And sometimes the very act of being victimized can be the portal to reconnecting with our true power. And we've all experienced it. Think about it. When people have crushed us and we've lifted ourselves back up, when we've been, you know, ridiculed, but also stood our ground and kept moving forward. So the enlightened victim has learned the power of compassion through personal experience. The enlightened victim has found victory and wants to support others, however it can be done. But the victim in both the shadow and the light and how compassion becomes a part of the enlightened victim speaks loudly, right? The victim is, a very, is very good at helping us become aware of patterns that don't work and behaviors that result in heartache and pain. But it is not enough to see what isn't working. It's at this point that the enlightened victim sets boundaries and setting boundaries is a two-part process, okay? At least for me, it was. First, you have to know what works and doesn't work, <laughs> okay? So like what boundaries will actually work in your life and what don't? In other words, you definitely need to find your spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental thresholds. Understand your limits. Because when your limits are crossed, shadow comes into play. So we do could actually observe our limits and understand where they are and then name them for yourself, right? Name or define your values to help you discover your limits and why you have them in the first place, right? I'm never going to marry a bum again, right? It took me for everything, right? There's a personal rule. Right. So the enlightened victim is aware of exactly where your boundaries are and why your boundaries should be maintained. And the enlightened victim, in order to protect those boundaries, is very direct and straightforward, leaving no room for the shadow victim to squeeze in. Right. But understanding that feeling anger is a good way to tell if your boundaries have been crossed and victimization is about to begin. So the enlightened victim helps you understand and define what boundaries will be, right? And then it lets you know when those boundaries are about to be violated. And then learning to direct and, you know, be assertive when the shadow is transformed right, from victim to the enlightened victim. And having and maintaining healthy boundaries really makes it much more difficult for others to take advantage of us, right? Like, I know that people definitely sense 
a strength in me. <laughs> and I don't feel like I am that strong that they sense, right? But I would never want anyone to see that I'm, I'm powerful. So you never are able to maintain, you will never be able to maintain good boundaries if you don't learn to take responsibility for the loss of those boundaries. And to me, that's interesting. So the enlightened victim is not afraid of weakness. It's not fragile. Okay. And even though we may feel that, the energy is strength. So if you learned that power can be found even in the shadow aspect of feeling like we're a victim to ourselves or others, then we can then we no longer are afraid of failures, losses, tragedies, or suffering or misfortune because none of those outer circumstances has power over our life. Right, We learn to be vulnerable and vulnerability is the keystone of our strength because it allows us to discover different kinds of power and it helps us recognize the strength of openness, right? Are we willing to be changed by our circumstances without losing our power? Don't let yourself lose power with your circumstances and let's go into relationships too because we all had good re we all had have good relationships that are healthy for us and we also have toxic relationships right both of those relationships are going to have to deal do and it will affect our positive and negative so whether those relationships are personal or professional, it is important to know that our shadow self pays close attention to those around us. Instincts are in play, trust is in play, loyalty, balance, all of our su su suppressed emotions lead to some kind of breakdown. And so our relationships work like karma. And what we pick up in our relationships creates the breakdown of what it is we're going to experience. And this can be instant or it can be a long-term effect, but it affects us psycho psych uh, psychologically. It is really important to have people in our life, at least one person, someone that you can trust, and many people don't have anyone. And if that is the case, I do suggest you to seek out a group or connect to someone that you may feel could be a mentor or a friend. But you do need to have somebody in your life that you can speak to, right? Or we can take a course. There's courses on how to be one for others as you seek one for yourself, right? We are naturally meant to have someone to count on. And again, if you don't have that, the universe will guide you to one. You just have to be open. And if you do have someone you can rely on and trust, that's great. Then let them be part of your growth and evolution. Let yourself be real in the light and the dark. You deserve to manifest everything you truly want and more. So Every relationship is an opportunity of self-growth, and we want to be thankful about that, but always move on, whether it's negative or positive, right? Our parents, our parents play a huge part of our shadow self. Some people have had fantastic parents, while some people have had horrible parents. Some may not have had parents at all. But you do need to consider your parents and your guardians and how you were raised and what experience it is that you experienced. Because up until a certain age, we're all forced to live in their conditions. I learned in my life that I was completely powerless and had no other option. I had to live the life I had to until I could become my own independent self. And that's actually when my healing path began. That was my freedom. 
And even if the household was a positive, loving environment, we are molded and evolve because of our environment. And the level of our involvement is up to us. And that is our unique ability. That's ours, right? So my personal life and path is about having freedom, being able to just be, okay, without traumas that my healing path requires. And it can and will happen. But we do have freedom in between the triggers, okay? Whether we had parents that never said, I love you, or parents that did, whether we had parents that asked us if we were okay, or parents that never did, it's important to let yourself reflect on your younger self and honor the good and the bad feelings. And once you understand them, you can take action. But you may also be able to understand certain patterns or situations that occur. So for me, Anybody that knows me, okay, they know I have car issues, okay? Like I have an unnormal amount of car issues in my life. It's been a thing, okay? And they're not just little car issues either, okay? Three vehicles and they all take turns shutting down. It's a total pattern. And I've had this issue with vehicles ever since my very first car. And I even actually have a brother that won't even let me sit in the front of his truck because he's worried I'm going to mess it up. Either way, my biggest dream is my freedom to be. I love going on drives. That's my number one thing. Take me for a drive in the back road. I always wanted to be a nomad. I'm meant to travel. I love going on adventures. I want to see the world. My freedom. Mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually is my purpose in life. And I believe that I help people find the freedom and the purpose they need in their life. So I created a healing path that has helped me evolve in a magical and mystical way. Because I found to work with my shadow when I realized that it wants the same thing as me. Your shadow and everything it wants, wants the same thing that you want, your higher self wants. And we've all had messed up experiences, but they do need to stay in the past. You do need to come to terms and honor the fact that your strengths do come with your roots. I love that through my traumatic experiences, I heard a voice that kept me safe and sane. I also hear the darkness of that voice when it's invoked. And because I listened to my inner voice and I walked the path of understanding myself, not trying to understand the ones that did me wrong, I was able to create a path that I'm on now. And I do love it. I am doing what I want to do. I am manifesting my dreams as you are. So as you learn to know yourself, you will also learn that we are a different person every day. We're never the same. And when we wake up the next day and we feel like yesterday, it's untrue. You're not. We're all, we're all different every day. And we're all the good, the bad, the ugly, the unhealed person can become the healed. The bad people can become good people. Good people can become bad people. It's all about personal morals and the levels of consciousness that we live in. And we all love, but we also hurt at the same time, right? It's a flow. It's a flow of the life force of the yin and yang, for example, okay? Comparison and competition is also something that invokes a doubt. And when we experience doubt, we live with it. We really do not know how worthy we are when we compare ourselves. So have you ever found yourself not being able to stand someone's actions or their behavior or their personality, but you don't know why? I mean, I do. Okay. My instincts, I'm telling you, I know if I like them or not, right? But 
when we become aware that someone has affected us in this way and realize that the, these feelings just came from nowhere, like it just happened in this unconscious way. It is a reflection and a message that we're suppressing ourselves. So for example, a positive person can get on our nerves when we're not positive, right? So how do we feel about others that put us into a state of being or unbeing? Being aware of how other people make us feel is important. Have you ever been around someone that drains your energy? They're psychic, they're, they're energy vampires, right? Maybe we have you have one in your life. Could you imagine having four psychic vampires in your life? Or even a dozen of them in your life? Like, what would you do, right? You don't want to reflect on it. But my point is, we do not want to be sucked dry. Our energy is sacred, and so is our energy levels. And our energy level is our individual life force. So we want to pay attention to our energy levels. But when you experience a drain, we have to do something about it to revive our energy and spirit. You need to receive energy and get into a flow until you feel like your normal energized self. You need to learn how to revive your spirit. Then we can actually learn how to limit our time around people who are draining our spirit, or we can wear protection things, you know, whatever it is that will protect you from, from energy drains. But competition is part of it. And competition can be healthy for the right reasons, right? If one is competing to be enough or because he or she feels inadequate, then that will create further feelings of low self-worth. But if you're competing because you love your passion and you want to evolve as a person for yourself, then it can be seen as healthy right? You take what you like in others and you see how you can create that in your own life. We also all experience the void. Like think about your heart. Think about that piece that's missing, right? The void. We all have a void and it's actually a void connection. I love my void. I love my little piece that's leading me to my wholeness. To me, that was like one of my, my, my strings in life. Where is spirit going to take me? So the void, our void connection, we all have an empty space. It's somewhere in you. Maybe it's in your heart and that has a, a void that's waiting for its destined fulfillment and freedom. Our shadow side and our higher self creates the void. The two of them create the void together. It's the path to wholeness, the space to become. And many of you have heard me in some of my other classes that I believe all of the magic we create comes from that dark matter, that void. And that void is within us. And it's around us. It's above and below. As above, so below is the void. <laughs> so this space is the space to become. So when we experience that feeling of emptiness or, or that we feel that void, it actually appears at, for a message. And it's a message that we need to focus on our wholeness. Get your focus back to seeking what it is that your shadow self needs. How are you feeding your shadow? Our shadow, it needs food. It needs something to go after within the void. The space between the realms has something to deliver and your shadow side wants to bring it, wants to bring something into your existence, something into your life, helping you feel that wholeness you are seeking. The void is our universal connection to all things that have not manifested yet. 
It is a space that comprehends our true being into manifestation. The void is the spiritual life force. It's not good or bad. It is. It's actually our will power. And with the will power, there's a few ways that we actually connect to it. With our inner vision and our outer vision. Did you know we have both? So people with an outer vision get information from the stimulation of their external reality. Inner vision is all about crafting the imagined reality first. Okay? Think of it this way. You're trying to get a raise, but you're not sure how to go about it. But someone with inner vision could close their eyes and get the idea of how to get it, what to say. Okay. So I want to go into the mask. We all have masks. Actually, we wear many different masks. A different mask for each relationship we have in our life. Think about the people in your life and the mask you wear, the persona that you take on. Our shadow is all of the things, the positive and the negative that we've denied about ourselves, that's hidden beneath the surface of the mask we forgot that we're wearing. I'm sure we are all automatic when we're around our mothers, right? And I'm sure we're quite different when we're around our best friends on a Friday night. <laughs> okay? So every single person in our relationship knows us as someone differently. And there's this cool um, poem that I want to share, Masks of Shadows. I think it is quite neat. Um, so Masks of Shadows, we hide behind our veils protected from eyes with closed minds, meanings distorted by merged hues, blurred by a false sense of self, shadows created by lies and self-half-truths, covered by gestures, accepting that which is familiar, we lose sight of who we are, shielded by intentional Denial, we find ignorance, like heavy blinds, offering little to no transparency, letting in the desired amount of light, controlling who we allow inside while dimming our own shine, feeling safer behind the scenes, afraid of who we weren't meant to be. We pass each other in shadow form, avoiding the true reveal with no risk of rejection. Slight glimpses of us trail away, drifting into ethers of escape, crying out to be hidden no more, hesitant to shed our masks. We remain our shadow selves. I mean, I think it speaks for itself, right? So there are ways on how to tame the beast. So I want to get into some of the cool, some more cool stuff about it. So how do you tame the beast? I like calling it the beast. You could call it whatever you want. Well, the first thing we need to do is acknowledge our shadow self, right? The shadow is a pile of everything we experience that we, sh we, we don't understand or all of the negative things we felt and experienced. It's a negative memory and many negative memories that pop up to remind us that we do need to focus on ourselves. So our energy is to do or our energy is to make sure that transformation is upon us when we are in a denser state it's time to release so if we go into our negative thinking remember that's a sign 
right? So we need to focus on ourself as well as self-talk. There's magic in self-talk. And this part actually does take a little training. I did this for an entire month. So if you do this for a month, you will, your mind will change. So turn every negative thought into a positive. Okay. You have a negative thought, fight it with something positive right away because it neutralizes your mind and it puts you into a balanced state. The higher self will come forward, right? The negative mind, the mental habits will actually tame. You know, so if you have mental habits that are negative, this is an exercise you need to do because all of a sudden positive ones will start to take place automatically. And so you need to neutralize that negative thought every time until all of a sudden positive ones are starting. There's no more negative ones. The positive ones are in power. And that's when your divine self speaks. And I really learned that. I used to tell my negative thoughts to fuck off every time I had one, fuck off. And then I'd say something, no, I want this. And I had a mental dialogue with myself for an entire month. And so you want to start this inner dialogue because you can learn from your shadow by having a conversation with it. But to do this, you do have to use a process that is similar to meditation. You have to ask your shadow questions and wait for an answer. So start question answering. Why does this person piss me off? Let your shadow self tell you, because he's an asshole, right? If you ever have a thought when you're sitting there experiencing and all of a sudden an asshole pops in, shadow, right? Or maybe the spirit world. So we do have to do that. Have a conversation, okay? Keep an open mind, even if it feels weird. Take note on the answers you're getting and make sure that you're listening without judgment. Don't listen to yourself with judgment. And the other way to commune with yourself is engaging in an inner dialogue. Like schedule some time where you can be alone and uninterrupted and engage in a dialogue with yourself for heightened self-awareness. I do that with my first cup of coffee. Every single morning, I have an inner dialogue on what I should be focusing on, what I observe, what it means, right? So you can have a conversation with yourself. You can even grab a pen and paper to write a list of things that rub you the wrong way, right? And that will help you determine what your shadow is made of. The other thing we want to do is accept. We need to accept all the dirty, negative, shameful experiences and go into a higher state of consciousness that will allow ourselves to be without judgment, right? When I'm a dirty bitch, I grin now, <laughs> okay? Because I know there's worse ones out there, right? And something came out, right? Like, whoa, that, that bitch came out today, right? Like, it's kind of... You know, you got to honor it. Don't be ashamed of negative feelings. We don't need to understand the shameful experience of why it happened. But we do need to understand what it meant for us and why we experienced it the way we did. So it represents our inner things that need to be surfaced for us to accept ourselves for the actions or the inactions, but also to heal within our present conscious awareness. Okay. Honor and respect. Like it's okay to feel negative. It's okay to make mistakes, but be responsible. So many people hold high regard to the things that they've done and yet they don't fix it. Take care of your feelings, the positive ones and the negative ones. Honor them, but seek to know them. What is your shadow side protecting? It's time to seek and to seek what it is that you really require, right? The ego and your persona are your entire conscious self. The persona is 
the ego, right? It's part of you. The mask you wear in any given situation. And we have multiple personas, different masks we wear for different people in our life. And all of the different personas are part of your ego. Okay. So for example, if you're a musician, the persona would be part of your conscious self that you present, you know, that, that you're present during your work, right? You have to play, but you may temporarily take off the mask during your lunch break while you're having meetings with some old friends, you know, you're not sitting there having music time. Or if you're having lunch with your colleagues, you may keep your musician pulse persona on the side, right? Composed because you're working with other colleagues, right? You may pull out a different mask while discussing something else altogether, you know, than a conversation you had about something else. So we do over identify with our social masks, right? And it's to the detriment of other important areas of our psyche, right? Us as a son or us as a daughter, a wife, a husband, a job title, a friend, a good citizen. But who are you? Because a persona is a compromise, right? It's a secondary reality in making which others often have a greater share than we do. It's a social mask of each of us wear with our interaction with others in society. So as you explore this topic, you'll realize that the persona is not the totality of our being, but rather a small component of a much larger personality, right? We all have a dark side, um, but mine is like a deep shade of indigo, right? We need to come face to face with it, okay? Understanding our persona is where we actually encounter the, the shadow, right? So I don't know if you've researched Carl Jung, but I definitely want you to research him. There's some really good books. Um, he's one of my favorite people. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I include this. But he stated that the shadow to be unknown dark is the side of the personality, right? It, it includes everything outside the light of consciousness and maybe positive or negative. Everybody carries a shadow. And the less it is embodied by the individual's conscious life, the blacker it gets. So the shadow is nothing more but the residue of the instincts and emotions and behaviors, right? It's the individual repressed to gain social acceptance of some kind, right? And when we receive negative feedback or punishment from a family or it creates anxiety, and then the individual hides these traits because they want to gain the social acceptance and these traits get pushed away from our awareness into the unconscious where they form the shadow, the darker side of one's personality to become aware. And then it integrates the shadow into one's personality and it wants to become a hero. And failure to do it will create chaos in our life because the shadow then becomes an active undercurrent that interacts with our conscious self and constantly influences our thoughts, our emotions, our actions in a manner that is beyond our conscious control. And often the shadow shows up in our life through projections, right? Instead of seeing the disagreement elements of the shadow in itself, it projects these traits onto others. And if an individual makes an attempt to see their shadow and become aware of it, you don't want to be ashamed of it. Because those qualities and impulses, anything we deny, right, this goes back into it. So our ego, our mental laziness, being sloppy, unreal fantasy, schemes, plots, carelessness, like I don't care, right? All of these need to be part of our self-education. It's, it's part of our life, okay? 
So I want to go into the anima and the animus. Jung said that the encounter with the shadow is the apprentice piece of the individual's development. That is the anima. It is the masterpiece. So Jung identified the archetype anima as being the conscious feminine component of men. And the archetype animus is the unconscious masculine component in women. And Jung stated that the anima and the animus act as guides to the unconscious unified self. And that forming an awareness and a connection with the anima or animus is one of the most difficult but rewarding steps in psychological growth. So the encounter with the anima represents a, con a connection to the unconscious, right? This unconscious is even deeper than the shadow. <laughs> the shadow shows up, right, uh, 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 with all of these unwanted qualities, but the anima is the contact with levels of the psyche that has potential to lead in the deepest and the highest reaches that the ego can attain. So to me, the shadow and the ego are meant to work together. And Jung viewed the anima process as being one of the sources of creative ability. Right? What do you want to create? So in these, so in cases where the anima or the animus are ignored, okay, and they are fighting for attention by projecting itself on others, this explains, according to Jung, why we are sometimes immediately attracted to certain strangers. We see our anima or our animus in them, right? Love at first sight is an example of anima and animus projection, right? People who strongly identify with people, right? They have not actively recognized. They don't know, but that connection is there, okay? And bringing those elements of the shadow into the light of consciousness is essential if one is to correct are less desirable aspects in life. The shadow carries in it the hidden source of nourishment that you know we want, that we need for our problems in life. So it can be a source of renewal over the established values of what the ego wants, right? And when things get into their extreme they turn into their opposites, okay? So some of the things that are important is the inner child, okay? Our inner child is our neglected inner child, right? It's our greatest opportunity for building strength. It comes from work with healing our wounds. The shadow is where our pain hides, awaiting for the light of our attention. And it lies beneath the distractions of workaholism, as well as compar comparison, comparing, right? So our inner child healing is a foundational part of shadow work. Childhood traumas or the way we are parented can result in deep wounds that can create behavioral or emotional patterns. And even ones that we are unaware of. <laughs> Okay, but in most cases, our shadow self is holding on to the desires of our inner child and just wants to be seen in the same way as the other parts of our self. So shadow work helps us uncover repressed feelings, thoughts, and memories so that we can accept and heal our shadow, bring it to the light, right? The repressed emotions would be all the things that were taught as a child right? Not to feel if you wanted to be loved, right? We don't feel it. So if we were only offered attention when we're good, 
right? You might find that the inner child holds rebellion or sadness and anger. Or if you experience trauma or abuse, you would have learned to hide pain and fear to survive. So the inner child can also hide all of the things that we were taught to think about ourselves by our parents, our teachers, other adults, other kids. And this can sound like, uh, you know, you better not say what you really think, right? How many times have you heard that, right? Or, or you're dumb or don't do that. It won't work. Or, you know, sex is dirty. And all of this is actually quite important because assessing our inner child allows us to find the roots of our issue as an adult. Inner child work can help us discover and release our repressed emotions but it can also help us realize what we're holding back we can recognize unmet needs assisting us to resolve unhelpful patterns right opportunity for increased self-care helping us to create and also create a playful self-respect right putting us on a healing path So the inner child was actually created as a self-help type movement and has become quite important in the spiritual and personal transformation theories. So you can do many things to heal and work on your inner child from inner child healings through meditation, hypnosis, uh, acknowledging your feelings, listening, writing a letter to yourself or others, you know, journaling, find your state of joy. That's what the inner child is about. Be open, find your state of joy. And Carl Jung included that a child archetype is in his list of archetypes that represents individualization, the development of the different parts of self into a functioning whole. But the true self is what we want to go for. Do you know your true self? How often are you your true self? Can you be your true self daily, right? Being our true self means that we acknowledge and honor everything about ourselves, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the divine, right? We are complicated beings of consciousness and very powerful. So whenever we're true to our feelings or the more we deny them, the more we move into our true self or out of our true self, right? And all of us have experienced an argument, right? And later on after that argument takes place, we're still thinking of it. We're internalizing all the things you should have said or maybe what you should have done or maybe wish you would have said or something else, right? We've all experienced that. We all look at the situation as internalizing but it's actually true, authentic communication. It's, it happens because there is fear to resistance to believe that what you said was heard or enough, right? It's perfectly natural, but it is a sorting and organizing ability that comes forward to help put us into a place from this experience. The level of consciousness develops from that future interaction. It's also a sign that you need to focus on communication. Be confident and learn to find your communication skills. They don't have to be strong, but they do have to be said. And the way you express and communicate yourself will be understood when you're in communication with your true self. So the things that you do not say will scream the loudest within, okay? So signs that your shadow work is is working, that you're connected to your shadow self. Other people's behaviors don't trigger you like they used to, right? You're not into, you don't even have time or the mentality to blame or go into a place of denial. You drop it. You also judge other people and yourself less. And you recognize that you've become part of someone's shadow, okay? And you're no longer afraid to be seen. And your life will become more peaceful, okay? 
So I know we are almost done here and I didn't even go into the different archetypes. So when you do get your workbook, don't do all your workbook all at once. Okay. Just do it as you feel, but you will also have all of the different archetypes. And there's actually like three hundreds, thousands of archetypes. Okay. But what I put together is a generalized list, right? Based off of Carl Jung. And it will help you recognize the different archetypes that we go into. So we're always connected to one of the archetypes that I put in the workbook. Okay. So let me just put pick one for right now. Okay. Let me see. So one thing I do want to talk about is working with your shadow, right? Putting it into a growth mindset instead of a limited mindset. So it's true. We are our own limitation and our growth is only generated by us. But if you actually take a look at successful people, they actually have a mindset, right? They're willing to learn from their obstacles or constructive criticism. They admit to learning openly. They're not on a defense. They all experience, they experience, all experiences as an opportunity to evolve, but they move swiftly through challenges, right? They want to get through that stuff as fast as they can. I believe that too. The faster I can get through a problem or an issue, the faster I can move on to the next thing. But they also put in the effort and a dedication that it comes to the desires that they want. And with that, they have to have their mindset. They have to have their free will make decisions rather than operate from negative patterns. So they take negative patterns and they transcend it into opportunities. And, and they are successful because they solve problems in order to get their desires. They don't give up. Okay. So I want you to go into some of these exercises and know that it is going to transform. It is meant to transform certain mindsets, get you out of limited mindsets into growth mindsets for yourself. Okay. But there is also a 10 step way to attract the life you want in there. Okay. So I do have uh, that in the workbook as well as, let me just see the archetypes. So I'm going to go through 12 different archetypes. And these archetypes that I'm using are ancient. They're universal symbols and characters that reside within the collective unconscious of people all over the world. So as you're learning about this stuff, you're also learning about me and everybody else around you and everybody else in the world. So as you learn and as you master yourself and understand the archetypes and recognize them in other people, like, oh my God, that person is this shadow archetype, use it as a tool, right? To get what you want. Um, you'll find that this is actually a guiding system that can inspire you, that can give you the, the, the possessing power to change things through our living day, every day. Okay. So for example, archetypes influence 99% of our human behavior. 99% of our human behavior is not ourself. So when you've got clicks in this class and you're seeing situations, right? That's normal. You aren't fucked up, right? That's normal. Everything you've experienced is normal life force. So there's nothing for you to be ashamed of. Okay. So one of the first archetypes, I'm just going to do this. One of the first archetypes is the ruler, right? The ruler archetype is all about control. They want power. Our, our, our ruler self control, power and order, right? It's shadow form is the tyrant. The ruler strives for excellence and wants everyone around them to reach their potential, right? They're natural leaders. They're decisive and they have a clear vision, but it's also referred to as the father type. And in some 
uh, philosophies, right? The shadow ruler is known as a tyrant. And this archetype takes control to the extreme. They are repressive. They're uh, uh, oppressive, right? They're dictators. They want to identify with themselves that, and they constantly need to prove their worth and power. So they might also feel the need to micromanage those around them, right? So every aspect of the self has a shadow side. Now, one of the reasons that I got involved, and you'll learn all of those, and you'll see where you were at different aspects in your life, different situations bring out the different uh, shadows, right? And the positive aspects of the archetypes. So each archetype has a positive and a negative, right? But shadow magic is always connected to the new moon. The new moon holds great power. So whenever there's a new moon, it's the shadow's moon. In traditional cult practices, people did not practice new moon ceremonies because it was believed to be dark magic. Dark magic for the new moon ceremonies and light magic for the full moon ceremonies, our higher self and our shadow self, right? Some people perform both. They perform a full moon ceremony and a new moon ceremony. But during the new moon phase, the nights are dark. And they're illuminated only by the natural light of the stars and other celestial objects, right? But the naked eye cannot identify the moon's proper position during this time. And this is due to the fact that the moon blends in entirely with the darkness between the stars. But during this time, the new moon controls our mind and our emotions and makes us mimic its behavior. So like the absence of the sun's light reflecting off the new moon, our awareness becomes easily darkened and hidden from view, especially around emotional and primal matters. And although the new moon may be hidden from sight, we should never underestimate its power and its influence upon us. So the new moon remains a powerful reminder of the importance of rest, contemplation, and rejuvenation. And on every new moon, it's actually designed to foster a connection, a reflection, and a goal setting. But know that the new moon marks the beginning of a 27-day cycle of fast-moving lunar phases that swell into the radiance of the full phase and before waning back into the darkness of another new moon. The new moon also marks the first of what is most agreeable of the two phases, the new and the full. So like a magnet, the new moon draws out very specific experiences, external and internal contemplations that, want, that we are meant to go through. So it's a good time to actively consider what you wanna manifest for the rest of the month, but set your intention and focus on your efforts. But no, that these intentions, these focusing, this effort is considered shadow magic because those things that you are putting up, putting on your paper has to do with what your shadow self wants. It's also an opportunity for us to set our emotional tone and be receptive for the rest of the month. So take note on what you experience leading up to the new moon right? Because this is the time that you need to keep your cool during this transit. Don't panic. Don't get too irritable with the dark. Whatever you do, just be mindful that the dark moon is with us. Because during the new moon, the motives behind any activity we undertake is shrouded in some kind of mystery. Motives behind the activity of others become unclear. So be warned, our instincts take center stage during the new moon. So it is, you know, the primal that we enter in the absence of the full moon light. 
and it's a very magnetic time full of opportunities and but spontaneous unplanned experiences right and this activity arises during this time to lead us into a place of confusion as well as put us into activities that will put us into um, a certain undertaking during the time of the moon. And it can be untidy situations. We don't want to overindulge. So remember, the new moon is an amazing time for beginnings, but it's important for us to be as mindful as positive to st- or possible to stay positive. We need to guard against a variety of negativity with our willpower whenever the new moons come up. And whatever energy we do feed during the new moon, it will be stored in our vault and amplified for the next month. And this can be positive or negative. So be careful. For new moons, I like to focus on healing. I do my drumming, right? I'll light a healing candle. I like to do healing work during the new moons. Regenerate my energy because the new moon is and energy regeneration. So new moon is a time to rest, right? The flash is out, there's no light. And now you can recharge in the dark and tell the lights return all the way to the full moon time. We have an opportunity to use this battery for the rest of the month. It will manifest something that is constantly on your mind. So again, Make sure you're sending out energy you want during the dark moon phases. And I know I'm almost done. This is a powerful time for us that we can spiritually get closer to change, right? If we can relax during the new moon and slow our body system down and create a clear focus of our emotional being, and what can be done, like what we want, then we have the ability to pull that power in to normalize our life, right? We go into a place of shifting energy that will complete the change that we want. As long as that place is in wellness, uh, we can actually create the life that best suits us by focusing on the new moon, right? We all know that there's a time when there's harvest time, right? Harvest comes at the arrival of a full moon. Well, there's plenty of light revealing what you've been planting along in the previous cycle. It's like planting a seed. We're consciously nurturing something that our shadow self needs, right? So we wanna keep the weeds out of the way and let our shadow do its magic. Okay. Now the energies of the new moons are different every month and they correspond to the astrological powers that are influenced by that new moon. So in the workbook, there is a list of the new moon energies and you'll be able to see the influences in your own horoscope sign as well as others. So if you do know um, that these traits are natural and universal, Um, you can use these traits and create magic that is uniquely yours. So remember that the new moon is a lunar cycle with its own unique influences. And the full moon is also a lunar cycle with its unique spiritual correspondences. But together, they are also a cycle as you go through the phases of the moon. Okay? So I am excited for you to get this um, and you'll be able to see how the new moon uh, corresponds with each sign. So when you see new moon in Gemini, uh, you'll know what it's going to do to you. Okay, so uh, what is a new moon coming? I got peak. What is December's new moon? New moon in what? Uh, I just got a peek and see what it comes up as. Capricorn. Duh, I should have known that. (laughs) Duh, it's December. Okay. So the new moon in Capricorn. Let's do that. And then I'll pull some cards and we are done. So new moon in Capricorn. 
Capricorn is associated with success through hard work. And a new moon is associated with a fresh start. So you can see how this would be a combination that you're looking for to turn up on your business, job, or financial situations. When there is a new moon in Capricorn, the stars are aligned for a new chapter of success. So what does your new, what does your shadow side need to feel for success? right? It doesn't matter what star sign you are. When a new moon occurs in Capricorn, you'll feel it. You're influenced by this energy. So when there is a new moon in Capricorn, it's a good time to make plans for the year ahead. Think about any changes you want to make in your career. If there's anything you want to study or travel plans you want to make, right? Give all of your dreams and visions full permission. Don't hold back. Start setting your intentions and begin creating your reality with this next new moon, which is what? Next Friday. Okay. So I also have new moon bath for you in there. Drinking new moon water. How to sit in silence and connect. New moon healing and new moon vanishing candles, as well as a new moon chant that you can enjoy. Okay. Whew. I think I covered it all. <laughs> that was a lot of talking and I didn't cover it all. So um, there is more in your books. So with that, let's pull a new moon. I want to pull some cards. I got to pull a card. I have to get it. Okay, one second. Let me get my card and then we're done. Okay, and if anyone has any questions or anything they want to say, I do have the chat up. So I'm going to pull a new moon, your first shadow self new moon experience. Show me the magic of the Capricorn new moon. Ready? So this is our magic, shadow magic for Capricorn. protection that is awesome so we're all protected that means our success protect our success for 2023 confidence Ooh, the shadow wants to be powerful and confident okay what else invoking your confidence as well and spirit guide it wants to be your spirit guide Oh, I love that. And before you go, I was, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I did. Um, but one of the reasons why I got involved with shadow work was because many of you know, I do tarot for a reading for a living, right? So I'm constantly doing tarot readings. And what I love about the shadow is that it is actually the tarot reversed. So for any of you that practice the tarot cards and the readings, reversed cards are the shadow aspects of the self. So just keep that in mind that, that when you get reversed cards, it is the shadow self in play. But that's how I learned all about it, right? Like the major arcanas our destined power right we can't we can't get rid of it they're in the reading that's the power universal power but when it's reversed universal power invoked shadow side so for you tarot readers check that out maybe do some shuffling and see which uh major arcana comes up reversed for you <laughs> show me my shadow self okay so with that, I'm going to let you go. This will be sent out tomorrow. 
and uh, your books will be sent out. I can't wait till you try it. And I'd love some feedback on what you think of the shadow self and or what you found with yourself. So I love that. Um, and I'll let you go.